This footage was filmed by the sole survivor of the Vega, the Soviet cargo ship which went down in the Indian Ocean on the 7th August 1950. To this day, the circumstances of this tragedy have never come to light, since no distress signal was ever picked up. Following the disaster, this passenger, whose identity we cannot reveal, filmed his daily log. The motor of his lifeboat has burned out and would appear to be completely unusable since the castaway is using his oars. First day, he shows us what provisions he has. We can see biscuits and his double water rations. A flare pistol. He seems not to have any instruments for navigating or taking bearings. His morale is good. Third day. Morale is still high. The man jokes about wanting a smoke. A squall is coming up. Ninth day. Atmospheric conditions are not improving. Fatigue is starting to set in. The man seems distressed. Fifteenth day. He has thrown away a container of water. It must have been empty or the water tainted. He shows us his provisions, which have diminished and which he has now divided into daily rations. His face is sunburned. His morale is suffering. It is twilight. This shot may have been accidental. It is undated. 21st day. Something must have occurred. The man is euphoric. He says, I'd film it if I could. He shows us his provisions again, and we can see that during the last six days he has not touched them. What or whom is he speaking about? How can he keep himself in such good shape? 27th day. The man is in better shape than on the 21st day. Watch him closely. His behavior has modified. Are we to understand from these gestures that he is watching the sea or that he is on his guard? What exactly does he mean? Look at these provisions, which remain untouched by him. How is he feeding himself? 33rd day. Watch carefully what is about to happen. The first thing he shows us is his provisions. This time they have gone down, but that still does not explain how he can have gone for 18 days without touching them. Look carefully at his face. We think that the man has already made up his mind. The dot you can see on the horizon is a ship. He picks up his flare pistol, which he has already prepared. He loads it. He is going to fire. He doesn't fire. He puts it back down. This decision might have cost him his life. Without doubt, at this distance he would have been sighted. Why does he not want to be saved? We are between the 34th and the 38th days. What you see is a box which was part of the debris of the shipwreck. This proves that he has been drifting. The discovery now profoundly damages his morale. Thirty-ninth day. He is very tired. His health is now endangered. He repeats, I don't see it anymore. What or whom is he talking about? In theory, this man should already be dead. Fortieth day. It is twilight. This is certainly the last of his rations. Forty-first day. Twilight again. Two days ago, this man was at the point of death. Where is he finding the energy to keep his gestures steady? 
He has just thrown away his last water supplies. He now has nothing more to drink or eat. We know that these flares are not intended for possible ships. What is he so sure of? Forty-second day. Twilight once more. We do not know why he is filming, but presume that he is on guard and is afraid of missing something. Pay close attention to what you are about to see. Everything takes place very quickly. Look, this is not a natural phenomenon. It is what he was waiting for. It is difficult to give an opinion about what we have just seen. For him, the voyage is over. He leaves a message. He seems strangely happy. We do not think that it is a question of suicide. He is resolute. This man has a rendezvous. The lifeboat ran aground on the coast of Madagascar. The salt spray had already half effaced the inscription that the man had written on the tarpaulin. Looking closely at the letters, one could read, those who have seen it can never come back. It's the, the rest was erased forevermore. The 2nd of December, 1953. As arranged, Miguel has met me on the way out of the village. He has finally agreed to take me to the nameless ones. He doesn't want me to film. He has spoken at length to my car, telling it that we are to go on a long journey, but that it will not be going all the way with us, and it must forgive us. The 4th of December. We have been gone for two days. Miguel has asked me to drive. He has accepted the camera since my assuring him that this film would only be seen once one or the other of us was dead. Miguel says that he will never be quite dead. Miguel has told me that his father lives on the edge of the other world. He would not tell me any more. 5th of December, we arrive at the house of Miguel's father. He tells me that his father was born soon after the beginning of the world and he is tired. He is never surprised by Miguel's visits because he dreams them two or three days before. Twilight, walking in the desert. The old man says, a long time ago, here, there was a village, and then the Great War came. It wiped out all the roads and the people got lost, and the desert swallowed the empty houses. The desert is always the strongest one. Miguel's father has told me that I am too delicate for the spirits of the desert, and I had better sleep in the car. I did just that. 6th of December. For more than an hour, Miguel's father has been consulting the desert. Around 10 a.m., the father has come over to talk to his son. He talks in a dialect that only Miguel can translate. If, on the second day, we meet a lizard crossing the road from left to right, we have to follow that direction. If, on the third day, a bird circles us twice overhead, we must immediately sit down and defend ourselves. It means they are not yet ready. If, on the fourth night, an icy wind wakes you, it means they want to test you and have asked death to fan you with his veil. On the fifth day, they may show you something or nothing at all. They are very powerful, but they hide themselves since what they do is not of our world. They capture words because no word is true and they drive them into the earth. Our mother earth is wounded by words that carry madness and the night takes vengeance on men and frightens them by setting the words free. And when the earth speaks to herself, I am terrified and I hide away in my cabin.
7th of December. Today we are entering the country where it rains stones. We must not speak all day. 8th of December. We have just seen the lizard. Now we must follow this direction. A stop at the end of the afternoon. I can hardly believe we have to actually follow a lizard. Miguel tells me that it was nothing but a lizard. 9th of December. Mid-morning, a bird overhead. Miguel is scared of me filming it. He thinks it is dangerous. We stayed in the position Miguel's father had shown us for more than three hours. Later, we headed west. 10th of December. On the other side, the land of the nameless ones begins. Miguel tells me that they can travel very quickly across this vast space, for sometimes they are really there, other times they are only dreams. He would not say any more. Miguel does not think we will have long to wait. I suddenly realize that everything has happened just as his father said it would. I am much more impressed than I let on. 11th of December. Early this morning, a figure appeared on the rocks. In front of my eyes, it headed for the rock face, only to reappear at the same instant 500 yards away. Miguel whispered to me that it moved with the dream. I didn't believe what I was filming. This evening, Miguel asked me to film myself with him. I have a premonition, but refuse to admit it. Twelfth of December. Early this morning, two figures appeared, and at the very moment I saw Miguel down on the rock, he whispered beside me, time is only an illusion. I turned towards him, but he was no longer there. I was filming by reflex. When I turned back to the rock, it was already empty. So I looked for them over where I had seen the figure the day before. I found them again on the rock. They gave me the impression of disappearing into the stone. And then I saw them again, about three miles away. At the edge of the precipice, they were looking out at their future destination. I thought they were going to wave to me, but they disappeared again. I knew I would never see them again. Later on, I went to the rock where I'd seen them and left Miguel's bag there. If there were any tracks, they would have been on the sand of the plateau. But by the time I got there, the wind would have wiped them out. There was nothing but my film. 17th of December. I arrived at Miguel's father's. He was no longer there, and the desert was reclaiming the cabin. I tried not to show any surprise. I had found out that not all beings have the same allotment of time and that those who can expand it become ghosts. Later on, I filmed myself cleaning the car and then wanted to carry on filming right up to the last frame to reassure myself, to convince myself that I was not one of the ghosts that Miguel had told me of one of those beings who return from the unknown to bring us messages that sometimes we do not understand. This footage was passed on to us by and could seriously compromise the relations we maintain with. We believe the film to date from the year of the... It is daybreak in a part of the world which we cannot situate. 
Anything that might provide us with information about these men has been altered or removed, and not a word will be uttered during these pictures. Careful examination enables us to confirm that this film has not been the subject of any faking. We do not believe that these images could have been filmed secretly. The cameraman was a member of the commando unit and has, as you can see, complete freedom of movement. We believe that this scenario was certainly intended as a disinformation operation. The setup is relatively simple. These men are keeping watch on the sea. Two of them are divers. The man you see walking past is no doubt playing the role of the leader. Notice how we end up seeing his face. This is intentional. This man is completely unknown to us. Pay close attention now to what is about to happen. The spot in the middle of the picture is a man swimming. Where has he come from? Is it him that the group was watching out for? It would be tempting to think so were it not for the fact that the pictures which follow were no longer filmed secretly. We can hypothesize that the cameraman knew the reality of this mission from the way he stays on this diver. He must know that he is seeing this man for the last time. Watch him closely, for in a few seconds this man will disappear before our eyes. This man, out in the middle of the sea, is a fearsome weapon. What follows is not play-acting. What has happened? The diver is panicked, he has no equipment, he wants to get back into the dinghy, the swimmer is preventing him. The other watches them. They must have passed under the dinghy. The diver tries once again to climb aboard. Why is no one helping him? The swimmer intervenes. Notice, however, that he does not do it with excessive brutality, even though he certainly could. The other diver's gaze follows them. They must have disappeared very quickly, since it would seem that he has lost them. He dives. He hasn't found anything. Look, the cameraman has spotted them at least 600 yards from the boat. How are they able to travel so quickly? There, he's still holding on to the diver. He's dragging him along. This man is fantastically strong. Watch now. He has just reappeared at least 400 yards from the boat. He is swimming with disconcerting ease. Right then, this man had decided to let us see only a tiny fraction of his potential. He dives again. We will not see him again. This has all taken place in real time, precisely 34 seconds. The other diver is flabbergasted by what he has just seen. He insists on searching the water, but he knows that he will see nothing there. The cameraman shows us that there is one person missing from these dinghies. That is the proof. Seven days later, the diver was washed up on a beach. He is now in a mental asylum. He is the only one who knows. This film has not been subjected to any editing. Its commentary was recorded under oath by the man who filmed it. My name is Kevin Riley. My name is Kevin Riley. I'm 31 years old. On the 11th July 1970, my friends and I had decided to spend the night under the stars in the Rogzaka Zone region. This is Cindy, my fiance. We're married now. And there's Stephen Payne, my best and friend. Stephen Payne, my best friend, who was 29 at the time of these events. We'd studied architecture together. <laughs> That's Karen, Stephen's wife. Karen, Stephen's wife. All four of us were childhood friends. We left, Greenfield around... we left Greenfields around 10 a.m. In the car, Stephen told me he was happy to be making this journey east. At about 1 p.m. we stopped at Pinewood Park, as we usually did whenever we took this road. We'd prepared a joke to play on Cindy.
Here, my wife is filming me. Karen and Stephen were very much... Karen and Stephen were really in love with each other. We used to like teasing them. We left Road 340 a little before... We turned off Route 340 just before 4.30 in the direction of Rogzaka Zone. It was the third time we'd been to this place. We passed the dunes. We crossed the dunes, then followed Rogzaka Canyons. I have to say that during the walk... I must say that the whole way, Stephen showed no sign that could have alerted us to what was going to happen. Around 6 p.m., Cindy and Karen were preparing... Around 6 p.m., Cindy and Karen were getting dinner ready. Stephen came back and asked... Stephen got back and asked us if we'd heard the music that was like crystal bubbles. He pointed in this direction. Indians call this place. The Indians call this place the river of stones that runs over the sleeping forest. We listened as hard as we could. We listened as hard as we could, but we couldn't hear anything but the desert. Stephen seemed disappointed. Stephen seemed upset and irritable. At this very moment. From that moment on, I had an intuition, a deep feeling that something was going to happen. When I see these images, when I see these pictures again, it feels like I'm showing you a dream. The shock came after dinner. Look closely at our dear friend Stephen because it's the last time we saw him. Look at the way he persistently stares off in the same direction. Stephen stood up. We don't know what's happening. He doesn't respond to our shouts. He's running and then he jumps. And right there on the dunes, we had to face the facts. Stephen had completely disappeared. His footsteps were the proof. Karen started screaming. She wanted to Karen started screaming that she wanted to vanish as well and go with him. Cindy tried to calm her down. Cindy was trying to calm her down. I was so blown away that I kept right on filming. And perhaps I did it because somehow I hoped this film would one day help us to understand how Stephen disappeared, what he'd heard, who had called him, and why this 11th of July he had leapt into the unknown at Ruxaka Zone. It was the sheriff who first informed me that at Morella, an entire house had disappeared during the night. In 1934, Morella was one of the largest haciendas in the region. The sheriff said that it was a district that had never had any trouble and that the peons were peaceful. That day, the estate owner didn't want to meet us. The sheriff reckoned there was something fishy, but he didn't want any problems with the guy. We arrived ahead of the villagers who were going over there in a procession. No preacher wanted to come along with us. The house had gone, but its inhabitant, the bruja, the witch, was sitting in her chair. The tree next to the house. The peon said she was a shape changer. The sheriff only had two deputies, so when the peons got there, he wanted to parley while he waited for reinforcements. The crowd was real jumpy. The dogs have been howling all night, the peon said, and tomorrow it's us who'll be howling. The sheriff told them that we were going to talk to the government about it, and the crowd calmed down so he could show me this child. Four days ago, he said, this child was bitten by the witch who had transformed herself into a coyote. The people are really worried. They believe anything they're told. And where has her house gone, I asked. I don't know. I really don't know. A 
A little later, the crowd was up against the ropes and they were shouting that the witch had to be killed. They wanted to lynch her. One woman, who was completely hysterical, was saying that she was going to be possessed if we didn't kill the witch right away. And then they fired in the air and the crowd didn't budge. What happened at that moment was very strange. I had the impression that the witch had hypnotized the crowd. Now, watch what's going to happen. Watch the woman who's kneeling. All this is true, it really happened, and it astonishes me when I see it today. The witch had really and truly disappeared. She knew what she was doing. Six months later, the story recommenced with the death of the estate owner. The hacienda had been immediately bought up by a mining company who were evacuating the peons. The militia that this company were employing were just a bunch of hoodlums. So I could film, I lied to them and told them I'd been sent by the company. They believed me. The villagers were lost. Some of them were saving what they could from their houses. Others were trying to make them uninhabitable. But any resistance would have been illegal and a lost cause, and they knew it. This old man was saying, a peon must resign himself to life, and that's what they did. Nobody mentioned the witch again to me, even if some of them believed she was directly responsible for their fate. These people didn't know where they were being taken. Later, I learned that the militiamen had left them near a disused mine and that several families had settled in there, while the others had kept on walking. There's never any end to an exodus. The caravan was just heading into the woods when a dog ran out into the road. I didn't see where it came from, but I attempted to follow it because I had a feeling something was going to happen. It went in the direction of the witch's house. And when I got there myself, the black figure had come back and the dog had disappeared. I was very frightened. I didn't dare go any closer. I didn't want to know what was under the veil. I knew nobody would ever believe me. This footage was shot by an American soldier belonging to the airborne troops who took part in the Sicily landings of July 1943. The pictures you see have undergone no editing and remain as we found them on the 19th August 1943 on the beach. This soldier was a very meticulous botanist for we found in his notebooks very precise descriptions and sketches of all the plants he filmed. There was, however, no other information which could be of any help to us. We questioned this shepherdess, who remembered well having met the soldier with his camera, but, as these pictures show, she had not wanted to be filmed, so she had not spoken to him. She was unsure of the date. The child told us that the man had given him chewing gum, stroked his little dog, and filmed his sheep. He added that he had been very kind and that he'd been looking all around saying, Bello, Bello. We were not able to question this old man since he died one month before we began our inquiries. 
Our man ended that 18th August 1943 up above the San Antonio lookout point, then set off in the direction of the beach. 19th August 1943. Our soldier seems to be alone on the beach. He tries shooting a panoramic view. He starts on another take. Watch very carefully. When the camera reaches the sea, we can see a dot emerging from the water, and then a second. He has spotted them and reframes his shot. He has changed lenses. These are apparently just swimmers, but their behavior is strange. They have actually risen up from the bottom of the sea. The child is the first to spot him, the woman soon after. He goes to meet them. There has been, as you will see in a moment, contact between the soldier and these two beings because he now films from the shore. Look here at the proof that these are not simply swimmers, how they walk on the seabed and do not reappear. Now he films their footsteps before they disappear forever. He is feeling the need to accumulate proof, in our opinion, because he himself is not sure of what he has just seen and heard. He goes into the water with his camera. Watch these images closely, because our man is right now making a terrible decision. He tries to show us the path they took. These pictures speak for themselves. The man wants to go with them, out there where, as he well knows, he will see and know no more. What did they speak to him of? Who are they? Unfortunately, we will never have an answer to these questions. For the notebook contains no information on these two persons. Was he intending to come back when he left his camera on the beach? Watch. What you are about to see is a true enigma. The soldier enters the water. He walks along the seabed. He has found the path of those he follows. An undiscovered country has opened to him. This man is crossing the frontier. He will never return. It is the 15th of April, 1990. The man you see in this footage is called Tibor Nagy. Today, once again, he will welcome the people who have been his followers for years. A very special anniversary is being prepared for here at the crossroads at Grand Central. And the story of how Tibor Nagy comes to be celebrating it is one of the strangest ever to befall a man. Tibor Nagy's real story started 36 years ago on the 15th of April, 1954, the day of his 40th birthday. Tibor, his wife, Helene, and their daughter Esther, then 12 years old, set off in their car for Woolworth, where Helene's sister lives. There are two possible routes from Cape Town to Woolworth, Route 27, just open to traffic, and Route 4, the old road, now empty of heavy vehicles. It is here, 25 miles out, that the Nagy's whole life will reach a turning point. It was about 10.15, Tibor would later declare, when a huge shadow stopped right above us and brought the car to a standstill. Nothing would work. My wife screamed. My daughter started to cry. I told them not to be afraid. And then it seemed like night fell all round us. I don't know how much later, when I opened my eyes, we were all in the car, and the car was in a round white room which was vibrating gently. I got out of the car, and suddenly, right in front of me, I saw the moon coming at me. So I took out my camera, which I always take with me when we have little get-togethers, and I filmed. I was shaking with fear. Good God, was I frightened.
abban a pillanatban a lányom fejére. Megpróbáltam megmagyarázni neki, hogy repülés és a élet szól minket. Ugyanekkor egy férfi lépett be a szobába. At the same moment, my daughter woke up, and I had to explain to her that I believe we have been picked up by a flying saucer. At the same second, a man stepped into the room. Man, what was he like? He seemed like us, but he was wearing a helmet on his head, and I couldn't see his face. He didn't say anything, but we understood that we needn't be afraid, and that I could film whatever I saw, but not the inside of the ship. I remember perfectly saying, yes, sir, and my daughter yelling, we're higher than the moon. I watched and filmed. I filmed till I was out of film, and then I felt like we were falling. When I opened my eyes, my wife and my daughter were at the back of the car, and we were a few meters away from a road we didn't know. And I told my wife and my daughter, God wants to test us. We must be brave. 36 years later, T. Bernaggi has taken his car back to the same place. All around him, every detail has been recreated, down to the field which has been cut the same way, and his words remain the same. When I opened my eyes, my wife and my daughter were at the back of the car. And we were a few meters apart, away from the road we didn't know really. And I told my wife and my daughter, God wants to put us to test. We must be courageous. No one believed Tibor Nagy's story. Those of us who remember the period will know that scarcely a day went by without some Ohio farmer or fisherman from San Francisco seeing a flying saucer. However, what makes the Nagy affair different is that he is the first to have managed to bring back proof. And that proof is his film, which you are going to see in a few moments. He may have convinced us, but not the investigators. Their surprise soon gave way to mistrust. And Tibor is taken for a hoaxer who just wanted to get himself talked about. It's said that he is the owner of his garage thanks to an opportune marriage. Within a few weeks, things start to go downhill for the Nagy family. Everyone is waiting for Tibor to own up and confess that the whole thing had been staged. Tibor refuses to do so, saying that he'll bring further proofs. If only the ones who had once carried him off would come again, he would be sure to recognize them and so be able to prove that he, Tibor Nagy, is not a liar. In February of 1955, the entire Nagy family settles in this tiny garage facing the crossroads at Grand Central. Four years later, his wife contracts pleurisy, which gets the better of her. His daughter goes back to live in Woolworth, where she will get married before going off to live in Canada so as never to see her father again. Ever since that day in 1954, Tibor waits in the place where they set him down. Over the years, the village has grown in population, but there is still an exclusion zone around his garage. His followers have named him the Madman of the Crossroads, but not in a derogatory way. On the contrary, Tibor is as respected as a man who has met God in person. And it is as if one were setting foot in a shrine on that day when, in remembrance of all his trials, he shows his film. It was April 15. That day, Helen, my wife, and Esther, our daughter, and myself, we should have gone to visit Aunt Martha in Woolworth. That was my 40th birthday. And it became dark. And when I opened my eyes, I saw the moon, like you are seeing it there. And then we have flown over it.
and I woke up. I thought being on earth, but I was in hell. The publicity given by the press to this affair was a kind of protection for Tibor Nagy. Others were less fortunate. Two years later, the inhabitants of this hamlet, situated two miles from the spot where Tibor had been carried off, and about which nothing was ever asked during the investigation, were evacuated, and sometime later the houses were burned to the ground on the road that led to them completely obliterated. Why did they want so badly to wipe out all trace of the Nagy affair? This home video, unique of its kind, is a warning. It was put together by Mr. D father of Peter and responsible for shooting the footage. Even as we tell you of it now, this story has only just reached its conclusion. As you are about to hear, Peter's father doesn't tell us everything. Far from it. And a lot of things remain mysterious. Wherever possible, we have tried to cast some light on those shadowy areas. The 30th October, 1979. My son and his mother leaving the hospital. Peter was born on the 14th October. The examinations were endless. I haven't found the matron. I'm convinced she lied to us. Sixteen days after his birth, Peter at last came home and our life changed. We didn't go out anymore. We didn't have anyone round. In these pictures, Peter is exactly a month old. Since we got back from hospital, we hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. His mother and I were happy and regaining our confidence. At three months, Peter was a very quiet child who smiled in his sleep, so we were sure that any danger was remote. Here, for reasons we don't know, the father's commentary ceases for several minutes. We'll get it back later. The images which follow perhaps explain this silence. It seems it all started towards the sixth month. Watch carefully. The mother is playing with Peter. While his mother's attention is elsewhere, the child looks up at his toy and the toy rises. It was the father who slowed down these images himself by way of silent commentary on this thing they'd been dreading all along. It is now the 14th of October, 1980. What has happened over the last six months, we shall never know. The parents enter the room and find the curtains of the bed, as you can see, in disorder. These knots, which the father comes back onto, prove it could not have been merely a breeze or the curtains coming unhooked while the child was asleep, but that it was the child himself who exercised his willpower on them. And if any more proof was needed, the child provided it the very next day, the 15th of October, when once again they found the curtains, this time in an improbable and it must be said rather disturbing position, and the parents do not hide their emotion. But how can they have let him do it? It's unlikely that they would not have kept an eye on the child alerted by the events of the day before. But those images we will never see, since they doubtless confirm to the parents that Peter would never be like other children. Here, our little boy is 18 months old. He has been under the doctors for six months. We are told that it will all pass given time and that we should carry on as if nothing was happening. It's true that at first Peter only used his power on insignificant things, but despite all our efforts, we had trouble coming to terms with the extraordinary. And as time passed, what happened was the exact opposite of what they had predicted to us, as we finally understood on Christmas Day, when Peter, who was three and a half, started to truly master his power. As you will see twice, he managed to unhook the balls from the tree, just one at first, but then he was so proud of what he'd done that he kept three of them up above his head with an ease that was entirely new. This was the first time he managed to display several objects at the same time. During these moments, Peter was so happy that we were quite disarmed. It was my parents who advised me to do laboratory experiments. I'll remember this day all my life. Peter was in an isolation chamber, and a man was asking him to make the foam rubber ball in front of him move. Peter couldn't do it and seemed completely lost. We couldn't speak to him. So what was he thinking of? Did he think we'd leave him there? Was he afraid of something? We never spoke roughly to him. Did he feel threatened by this doctor who kept giving him orders? Did the man use a gesture or expression that Peter could have misinterpreted? We have asked ourselves these questions and many others over and over again, trying to find an explanation for what happened.
Peter tried to explain that he couldn't do anything with the ball. So the doctor asked him to concentrate on him and to look into his eyes. Peter complied, and a few seconds later, the doctor staggered out of the room and said to us, I pity you, he's a monster. Ever since that day, we've kept Peter completely isolated, fearing that he might turn into a fairground attraction. Sensing what he was capable of, we saw nobody anymore. We lived with his power like a handicap that had to be completely hidden. We were helpless, we didn't know what to do. But these little family moments remind me how happy the three of us were. We were living a sort of secret life, completely turned in on ourselves, and I don't think we ever realized just how used to it Peter had become. He didn't mind at all spending his days in the garden with no one for company except his parents and the dog he was so intensely attached to. Here, the father's commentary stops once again. The rest is written in haste, but from what we have heard, we can have an idea of the final drama. Look carefully at this photo, which brings together everyone. We have good reason to believe it was taken on the eve of the terrible events. Who would think from these smiling faces that in a matter of a few hours this family will be doubly hit? Our inquiry has established that the next day they were all to go to home of the school, specializing in children who, like Peter, show the particularities that you now know about. The first words scribbled by the father are, I told him that we wouldn't be able to take the dog. Peter's reaction is not slow in coming. It is every bit as intense and final as the love he had for the animal. He couldn't take the idea of being separated, continues the father, and there was nothing we could do to calm him down. What Peter is capable of is terrifying. What happened a bit later when his mother attempted to reason with him, I was not able to film. What happened was an accident. I am leaving this cassette behind as testimony. Don't anybody try to find us. It's not his fault. I love my son. This story reached its denouement less than a year ago. After the events you have just seen, Mr. fled with Peter into a mountainous region. They would hide there for seven years. During the winter of 1990, Mr. fell gravely ill. Peter, who was just 11 years old, decided to go down to the valley. He managed to cross the Snowdin Hills and thus save the life of his father. Today, Peter has lost none of his powers and is cared for in a specialist institute. In 1961, on the plateau of Takahama, the first exchange took place between earthlings and were referred to by the term guests. To honor this extraordinary opportunity, our two countries put aside their differences. The place of residence of the guests was this military camp, which they did not leave for eight years. The buildings on ground level at Takahama made it look like a modest training camp, but its imposing underground structure housed extensive research units. Nothing has ever been leaked about the type of experiments that were carried out there, the number of persons involved, and the research is pursued, even if we can easily guess as to their purpose. But as we can see from this footage taken after the evacuation of Takahamo, all sensitive areas have been sealed off or destroyed. These precautions are a sure indication of the importance of this location and the secrets it still surely contains in the heavy silence that surrounds this gigantic wreck of top-secret scientific research. In 1967 came the return but the three earthlings were never to come back from where they'd been sent. Of the guests, only two were present, one of them, according to the official version, having escaped. The Takohamo mystery had begun. Ten months later, one of the guests, answering to the code name Alson II, was found in a district of... On one of the tapes recently released by the International Commission on... You can hear this recording by Agent... reporting on these images, the only ones we possess of this surveillance. Alson II is a subject kept very precise and regular hours. He only appeared at the window at the close of day. He was always dressed to go out and gave the impression he was watching for a signal or waiting for someone. 
During the two months of this surveillance, Alton II was completely alone. He never replied to the telephone, despite our frequent calls, and only went out two times a week. He always bought the same thing. I don't know where his money came from. The footage from when Alton went out has been destroyed at the request of... One day, Alton II got onto it. Uh, I think he may well have known of our existence for a long time. Since from the day he went into this house, he never switched the light on. One day, Alson II actually manages to slip this close surveillance and disappears again. Has he really escaped, or is this a transfer disguised as an escape? We shall never know. One year later, in those circles responsible for leaking Secret Service documents to the press, this unidentified film does the rounds. We are in a studio equipped with surveillance cameras. The mountain we can't help noticing is in the United States. It is inside of Lake Memphremagog. We are therefore on the Canadian shore, a precaution in case of incident. This footage was taken on the 17th July 1969. It shows us an individual who resembles the man we saw in the house. He must be in pain as he is taking medication. These medications seem to bring relief for a few hours. If this man is Olsen too, his condition is reassuring, since he is clearly too weak to pose any threat. Any danger, if there were any, is thus remote. But it becomes apparent with the first pictures that what we are being shown is the interior of the house, which remained unseen by us in the surveillance tape, whose authenticity cannot be doubted. This permits us to hypothesize that this film is a fake, since it insists on showing us something which we have never seen and which has no point of reference. These pictures are from the 18th of July, 1969. Remember this date because the choice of it is already a start to resolving the mystery of Takahama. This footage was doubtless destined for the entirely respectable archives which wrapped up the experiments at the base. But who really is this man was shown? Was he already sick? Did he know what was going to happen to him? In these pictures, he is surely being spoken to. If not, why the loudspeaker? Why don't we hear the sound? What is really being said to him? He seems to be totally lacking in any reaction. What orders are being given to him? It is the 19th of July, 1969. Look, at the right-hand corner of the bed, his box of medications has disappeared. Were these medicines or antidotes? Is this the reality of the fate he so anxiously awaits? It seems he has just found out the answer. Watch carefully what is about to happen. In a few moments, this supposed Alson too will achieve his destiny. But we are sure that his fate was decided a long time ago. Had he been conditioned? What choice did he really have? We are to be spared no unpleasantness, for it is more important now than ever that this man die today and that his death not be in doubt for one moment. These images are a message to the whole of humanity. Olsen II died on the 19th of July, 1969. The next day, the 20th of July, 1969, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. The Takohamo mystery deepened a little more. Hello, my name is Henry Matthews, and I am the host of the At Once Show broadcast live on WACN-TV. Today, in order to bring my testimony to the Documents Interdits series, I would like to show you some pictures that very few people have ever seen. But first, let me tell you a little bit about At Once. Three times a week, we open the television station switchboard between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight on a simple call from a member of the general public who wishes to bear testimony or would like to shed light on some particular event or situation that we agree should be exposed to the public, we dispatch a mobile television crew so that we can all witness live the development of the situation. In the three years that we've been uh, broadcasting this show, we've never run into any true serious problems. Oh, we've had some rather strong, intense moments, but never anything that could have endangered the crew's life. Uh, although they are often subject to uh, rather erratic and peculiar human behavior, very different people living in all sorts of places. No, I would say that At Once is the sort of television, television show which needs an enormous technical backup because 
We are willing to go anywhere. We are on the lookout for anything. And we show everything. On May 15, 1989, at 8.45 p.m., we received a call from Mrs. Anna Marie Ferguson at 1036 Sun Avenue. Good evening, go ahead. Your name and address, please. What's that noise? What are they? Animals? Squatters? Water pipes? Have you called the police? Do you feel you're in danger? Okay, Mrs. Ferguson. They're in your house. They're noisy. You don't know what they are, and the police have found nothing. Hello? Hello? Well, it looks pretty deserted, if you ask me. I think I want to verify the address. Uh, Henry, Henry, could you confirm the address for me, please? Hmm. Well, this is the place. I don't see an intercom, so uh, what I think we're going to do is just uh, continue along up the driveway till we get to the house, and I'm sure that we'll find Mrs. Ferguson there. She's probably seen us arrive on the television set, and she should be waiting for us at the front door. Just want to remind you, we're at 1036 Sun Avenue. We got a call from a Mrs. Ferguson. Apparently, she's been hearing some uh, mysterious sounds inside her house, and we want to check out what that's, what that's all about. Mrs. Ferguson? Mrs. Ferguson? It's the at once crew. We're here. No answer. I don't see any lights on up there either. In fact, the place, uh, the place looks a little empty right now. While we're waiting for Mrs. Ferguson to come out, why don't we take a look at these grounds, uh, what we can see anyway. Some trees over there, and a nice wall. And this appears to be, I'd say, oh, a manor house. It must be probably a good hundred years old, but it's in lovely condition. Ah, there's something here at the front door. Mrs. Ferguson. Mrs. Ferguson, it's the at once crew. Come on out and meet us. We'd love to see you. Maybe she's a little bit shy, huh? <laughs> well, that's okay. Maybe she'd like to remain anonymous. We at the One Show certainly do respect your, anon your anonymity. After all, this is your show, and, uh, well, if you choose to do that like that, that's just okay with us. We're just here to help you get your show going. Mrs. Ferguson, come on up. See what's going on here. Mrs. Ferguson, if you can hear me, it's the At Once Show. Would you mind if we came in? That's pretty strange. Hello. Let's take a look over here. As you can see, this is a very spacious and gracious house. And someone could hide here for a very long time if they didn't want to be found. Take a look at that. Beautiful frescoes on the ceiling. I would say that that's uh, an indication of the tastes of our hosts, of the people who live here from whom we'd be very pleased to receive a guided tour at any time. Let's take a look upstairs. This is Ferguson. It's the At Once crew. We uh, took the liberty of, of allowing ourselves in because uh, you opened the door for us. Mrs. Ferguson.
Well, here we are in a small lounge, which is right next door to a much larger lounge. And as I get to take a, a look around here, I see that it's, it's, it's absolutely filled with pieces of art, all shapes and sizes and descriptions. Obviously, this is the home of the great collector. But we still haven't seen Mrs. Ferguson, nor has she given us any indication of where she is. Henry, can you hear me? Because I certainly cannot hear you. I've got to tell you something. As you might be able to see, our light has gotten quite a bit dimmer. And uh, we lost contact. I don't know if it was uh, if we were cut off or just what happened, but it was, it was very strange. I don't know, did you receive me? It's the At Once crew. We're live on WACN-TV. Mrs. Ferguson. Mrs. Ferguson. Mrs. Ferguson, would you come out, please? This is where we cut off. Because suddenly, this horror film situation turned to drama. Sometime before, Another car and crew had left to go to 1036 Sun Avenue. And the pictures we received were these. The car was the undeniable proof that it was the same place. 1036 Sun Avenue. Now, watch carefully the pictures that follow. When I put the first crew back on air, this is what I received. Henry Matthews, I think you can still hear me, even though I, I can't hear you. So I'm going to continue with our visit. I don't know how much you can see, though, because I've never done a live broadcast in the dark. But uh, while we still have a little light left, we're going to see what's around here. Just a second. Come in here. Take a look at this. What? This is very strange. Uh, it's all over the floor. I don't know what it is. It looks like it. Incredible. It's like snow. In the beginning, we couldn't believe it, and we kept switching from the inside to the outside. But then we had to admit that we were facing some kind of supernatural manifestation, uh, uh, a, a different reality. I had only to push that on-air button to let 12 million viewers see this spectacle. But I couldn't push the button. This corridor is far too long to be part of the house we entered. I gotta tell you, I don't... I don't feel very comfortable about this whole situation. There's something uh, unhealthy, almost, uh, almost unreal about this place. I don't know what it is. One thing I can tell you, it's not fake. And to prove that to you, we're gonna keep going until we find out exactly what's going on around. Mrs. Ferguson! Well, I don't know about the, the quality of the pictures you're still receiving, but can you see that over there? It's, uh, it seems to be, uh, it seems to be an almost uh, human-like shape on top of, uh, on top of what seems to be a sofa. Let's go a little bit closer and take a look. Now, if you're feeling a little sensitive, maybe you just you better back away from the TV screen. Mrs. Ferguson? That's no, nothing. I thought I heard something over there. Let's go check it out. Almost beyond this wall, it seems. Is this? It's, it's... this house is in total decomposition. You see that? Beginning to wonder if we still have a ceiling over our heads. This is Ferguson. I would like you to stay watching this picture as we did. Powerless, eaten by anxiety, not knowing what to do. We made inquiries. So did the police. 
We searched the place from top to bottom. In vain. All that was left to us was that telephone conversation recorded at the switchboard at 845. But there again, another great surprise awaited us. We had it analyzed to the extent of rooting out the words that were hidden underneath all that crackling. You'll remember that the uh, connection was very poor, that the, the voice seemed very distant. And indeed it was. That conversation dated back to the 1930s when Anna Mae Ferguson lived in that house. Uh, in those days, the region was developing so rapidly that the city development couldn't keep up with it, namely the sewers. And so the, uh, they had a lot of rat problems for a couple of years. And Mrs. Ferguson was, in fact, calling the exterminators. Well, you can uh, imagine the interference on the line. never saw them again. We are somewhere in Eastern Europe, a Western commentator would say, delighted to have fallen on a scoop. After long months of bargaining, this barrier was finally put up for the sake of politics. Uh, officially, we did not need permission to film since we are not in a camp, but in a sheltered residence. Those who live here do so of their own free will, because there is nowhere else they could live. These occupants are men from SCAR. SCAR is the code name of a program of biomechanics. That science which aims to improve human performance, to turn men into semi-robots. Don't laugh, for no sooner had this idea occurred to some uh, professor brainstorm than it was put into action. Conceived during the Cold War, this program was pursued into the 70s. But then what with the war with the West that never seemed to come and the results that were obtained, the research was abandoned. Today, the men who paid the price for this experiment have been brought together in this building, sheltered between a lake and the thick forest, away from prying eyes. We will only see this small group. It seems the others did not want to come. But they can easily be heard in the testimony which follows. Go on, speak for us. Yes, Peter, speak to her for us. Hello, Piotr. Thank you for talking to us. We don't trust those cameras of yours. They see us as circus animals. We'll show you everything we film, and you can tell us if you like it or not. Fine, like that, it's all right. Uh, Piotr, tell us what happened to you and how you come to be here. About 30 years ago, I was working in a sawmill. One day, my right hand and arm were torn off. While I was still in hospital, they came to see me. When they saw me, they said to me, look, your hand is done for, no ordinary doctor can do anything for it, but we can help you. They could propose to me an experiment to get my arm better, uh, but for this they had to send me to, to the center. That's where they have all their facilities. Uh, since I had no wife or children, I thought it over and in the end said yes. There, look what they did to me. They call that an arm. It's true, I can carry 950 kilos and press up to one and a half tons per square centimeter. But the thing is, uh, it's all homegrown technology and it works like everything else here. You know what I mean. Here's where I live. All those dents, I did them with my elbow. My arm starts off by itself, suddenly, all over the place, and I break everything. Those lumps, too, it was me that did them. It was me that dented it. My arm went off like a spring. Everyone laughs at the noise it makes. And there's my reinforced bed, and the walls are reinforced. Like the door. Hello, Piotr. Mm 
Smile, you're on TV. And that's what things have come to. I wanted to open the window and my hand got stuck. That's the story of my life. A simple gesture, a tiny gesture, and it's catastrophe. Let's try it like this. No, that won't work. It's too small. No, that's no good. It's no good. Let's try something else. Go on, try it. This one's stronger. No, it won't work. Let's try again. I'll be back in a minute. All right. Life stinks. Life stinks. My grandmother was right. Life stinks. Ilyush! Ilyush! Where's he gone? I'm glad to see you guys. It'll be drinks all round. Well, our friend stuck, are we? Yeah, the bastard's stuck. Come on, let's try. All together now. Careful, it's a hand. One more time. We should try the blow lamp. Don't worry. Careful, it's a hand, you know. One more time, give it a try. There, that's it, push. Great. You couldn't break the window by yourself. You had to call two other guys in to help. Stop, stop. You're going to break the teeth on the saw. You'll crack the blade. Get the blow lamp. Keep still. Okay. Go on, go on. A little bit more. There. What a job. This man's an expert. The next time you want to open the door, use your feet. I'll do my best. Let's go to the hospital. Tell me if it hurts. Don't worry, I know you've got golden hands. Go right ahead. No unauthorized close-ups. Strategic material, top secret. It's rusty. Here. Here and there. We'll have to soak it in oil. And have you got any oil? How do we do it? We'll manage. We Russians are incredible. We can get out of anything. Some lard. On a low flame. On a low flame. That's it. Hold it right in. You should put a pinch of salt in. Why not? How's the invalid? All right. Let's see. Let's see if it's okay. Ah. Good, we can operate. The smoke's a nuisance, but I don't want to risk it cooling down. Because last time we had to start all over again. You should ask them for a fan. 
Keep these rags on the joints. And we'll have to see you again. There are 823 like him in the camp. Officially, the SCAR camps throughout the territory number 15. That makes almost 12,500 forgotten by the Cold War. Note 1. I've chosen Peter Thomas, 41, an engineer. He has the same hair and eyes as me and is the same height. His father's dead. His mother has left the country. Note 3. Klaus Thomas, his son, 10, sets off to school every morning at 8.05 with his friend Karl Meyer, 11, who comes to get him. Appendix 3A, ground plan of the house. Note 4. Sabina Junger is 43, father and mother deceased, married to Peter Thomas for 15 years. They moved into the house at number 68, he has crossed out the address, 13 years ago. Note 6. Once every two months, Sabina receives a letter from Margareta Bauer, 78, her only aunt, who lives in the provinces. Note 9. Sabina is watching her husband. Every day when he comes home, she's taking in the washing. I've noticed that she often washes the same towels. Peter hasn't realized this. Note 12. On Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Peter leaves the plant two hours early. Note 13. Peter visited Office 208 to put in an application for time off. Note 18. Peter is having an affair with Elena Markov, 31. They leave the apartment 12 minutes apart so no one will see them together. Appendix 18A, soundproofing the camera. Appendix 18B, concealing the slot opened in the lavatory door on the landing. Note on 18B, the location is smelly and surveillance conditions there very uncomfortable. Note 19. Their love nest is the apartment of Johann Müller, 82, a widower with no children. He's been in hospital for 64 days and won't be coming back. The room smells of body odor, stale tobacco smoke, and dirty sheets. 19A, appendix, inventory, plan of the premises, names of all the tenants in the building. Note 23. Elena has been working as a cleaner at the theater. The name's been crossed out. Her colleagues say she got the job by sleeping with Marcus Hopfner. He's crossed out the rest. She's often late for work and doesn't have many friends there. Appendix 23A. Names and addresses of all the theater staff. Note 25. Peter buys her nail varnish and she wears it on her fingers and toenails. Elena is friendly with Helena Schmidt, 63, who covers for her whenever she's away. In return, Elena gives her lipstick. 
Note 28. Elena is known as Elena Mikulic in her building. She lives with her mother, Anna Maria Mikulic, 65, a widow and alcoholic. Appendix 28A, list of tenants in the building. Note 32, I enter the house while they're in the garden and see Peter lose his temper with his wife, who was supposed to bring in the wood earlier. He's angry with his son, too. Klaus nearly caught me. That won't happen again. Appendix 32a, photo of the sets of keys. Note 34. The park where Elena meets her brother Ulrich is always empty. To approach them, I pretend to be an old woman feeding the birds. Note 35. Ulrich, 32, unattached, works at the hospital. He no longer sees his mother. He found the apartment for Elena and sold old Johann Müller's possessions without waiting for him to die. Appendix 35A, list of meetings between Ulrich and Elena over eight weeks. Note 36, I'm an electrician with cap, jacket, and heavy glasses. The house is messy and smells dirty. Appendix 36A, State Electricity Department House Call Voucher. Note 40. I concealed the camera when I made the electrician's visit. It films at 18 frames a second. It's on the little shelf in the bedroom aimed at the mirror that reflects the bed. It still makes a very low sound, but Sabina couldn't tell what it was. Peter came home at 2.33 in the morning. Sabina pretended to be asleep. Appendix 48. Diagram of the electrical circuit enabling control of the camera from the lamp switch. Note 46. I've hidden my face under a bag. I don't want him to know I look like him. I go out and come back with another voice. I've told him I'm the other man's accomplice and I could get violent. He keeps saying he's ready to answer all my questions. I don't have any because he'll tell me the truth. Note 48, 1738, I've already done this, there's nothing more exciting than this, going home for the first time, they'll listen to me, love me, see me, I'll point them in new directions, change lives, correct futures. Note 53. On Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I reload the camera before Elena comes. She's been working, so she smells of perspiration, and her odor lingers in the apartment. I have a shower, so her smell doesn't stay on me. I've jammed the door of the stove. It can't be filled anymore. Appendix 53A. Diagram of the electrical connection synchronizing the camera with a five-second lag once the front door is closed. Note 55. Sabina is suspicious of the way I've changed. She's wondering how much my sudden enthusiasm for Super 8 will cost. Note 58. I haven't been in touch with Elena since I've been the other Peter. I'm waiting for her to make her move. Appendix 58A. Installation diagram for another camera after the first broke down. Note 60. My new family are used to my new toy. They barely notice the camera. Klaus loves his daddy again. Note 
Note 61. Elena will soon get tired of waiting. She'll make her move, and if I give Sabina a taste of happiness again, I think she'll want to hang on to it. Sabina doesn't have a mechanical weapon that makes a noise, and she mustn't use a knife because that could leave blood on the floor, which would be difficult to clean off the boards. Elena still expects the heating to start working again, which makes me laugh. Appendix 61A, reinstallation of the camera in the stove behind the perforated plate. Note 64, Sabina is worried what the neighbors will say about the camera. She often talks about money. She senses that something about me but doesn't know what. It worries her. I like to see that uncertainty on her face. It means I have to be very attentive, and the more attentive I am, the closer Sabina and Peter are again. Note 65, blackmail. There were three photos in the mail. I intercepted them. They were taken in the Müller apartment by the camera fitted with a timer still on the stove. Note 71. Elena told him he's not the same. Ulrich asked her if she wanted him to do something. Elena said nothing. It's up to him. Appendix 71A. The camera didn't run smoothly with the cold. Check the muff. Note 73. At 8.38, Ulrich is stealing from the hospital laundry and uses the rear courtyard entrance. Peter doesn't want Elena to break up his family again. He has to act quickly. He calls this initiative preemptive self-defense. Appendix 73A. Those who can't fight should let other people who want to kill them do it cleanly. Ulrich tried to get away from Peter and didn't fall right. He wasn't caught on camera. Peter had to film him by hand. It was risky, but absolutely necessary. That's the second mistake I've made in this operation, and it won't happen again. Appendix 73b. Since the fall didn't kill him, Peter decided to drive over Ulrich as he left. Note 75. Peter says he didn't do anything, yet on film he's the one seen escaping after running over Ulrich. I'm making him do things he'd never have done. He realizes that his former life was hollow and he's unhappy. Appendix 75a. Peter pissed himself. I don't like cleaning up, but the smell's bothering me a bit. Note 79. I showed Sabina a film of Sabina, and she told me off for wasting money. I came out with a grand phrase. When I film you, I learn how to see you. Sabina didn't like that, but she finally let me get closer, and I read the look in her eyes as an encouragement to take things further. Note 80. Adjustment and installation of a totally silent camera fitted on a little shelf. No more need for the mirror. Note 80a. I changed the bulb of the other lamp. Tonight I'll be a completely married man, but I'm still going to keep my pajama jacket on. Appendix 80b. Notes on camouflaging the camera and a new diagram of the electrical system linking it to the lamp switch. 
Notiz 84. Note 84. Wenn Peter Auszüge aus When I show Leben Peter zeige, snatches of Peter's life, he just won't see how lucky he is to be able to fix it. Although I've sorted everything out now, he doesn't like seeing his wife happy with him. I deal with his stubble so he doesn't change. Notiz 88. Note 88. I've written a letter to Sabina and copied Elena's signature. Elena will keep quiet if she agrees to a divorce. I've enclosed the photos and a document proving Peter embezzled money from work to pay for their car. I've also sent the key to the love nest and the time at the meeting. Appendix 88A, accounts voucher from the plant. Note 92. Sabina could go to prison with Peter. She could also lose her son and house. I can see her anxiety. I like her silence. Note 98. I waited for Sabina. She came well before the time planned for the meeting and the neighbor nearly saw her. Note 99. I'm pleased. The lock switch worked properly this time. That sort of little device is always very fragile. I listened at the door. They both realized they shouldn't make a noise the neighbors would hear. I knew Sabina would be stronger. She's a silent woman like me. Note 100. Peter sorted everything out. He showed me how he burned Elena's fingers with acid to remove her fingerprints and make her difficult to identify. The acid he used smoked a lot, probably because of the poor quality nail varnish. Appendix 100A. Note on the acid used, the quantity and the precautions needed. Note 102. To make Elena's body impossible to identify, Peter cut her head off. He had to wait to remove the body. He rolled it up in a plastic sheet and slid it under the bed like dust under a carpet. Peter dismantled the little contact device in the door, filled the screw holes and concealed them with a drop-up paint. Note 105. Peter personally let Elena's mother know that her daughter and son were dead. Appendix 105. Elena's mother smells terrible. Note 107. Sabina is wearing the pretty dress I bought her. She's a very good liar. She'll be very useful. It's time to go. I can't afford to get attached in life. Note 109. Peter has returned home. I make and break lives as I want. In my notes, I already have two lives that belong to me. One day, he has crossed the rest out. Note 1. Second assignment. I'm the night watchman. I have access to all the offices at night. Appendix 1A. Names and addresses of all the bank staff. 